Our reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5 and we'll, we'll read the whole chapter. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are here at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live not by faith, but by, we live by faith, but not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body, away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due to him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know what is to, it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade men. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, it is for God's sake. If we are in a right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view though we once regarded Christ in this way. We do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. May God bless us as we search the scriptures. This morning's word is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and it's verse 7. And it says this, we live by faith, not sight. We live by faith, not sight. Uh, today's word, I believe, is a simple word. A simple message, yet within that simplicity is a profound truth. And also for us today, a challenge. I believe as Christians, we need to be challenged. Because otherwise, we reach a plateau and we sail along on that plateau. And we don't seem to move forward, up but sometimes we go down, but sometimes we don't come up much at all. And so we need to be challenged in our Christian faith day after day. I guess at times all of us have wished we could see what lies ahead. If we're in a situation that's causing us anxiety, maybe we want to see the end of it. We want to know what the end will be. We know what the end we want to see. We've got that firmly in our mind. But we long to see the end of it, and we can't seem to see the end of it. I keep a diary, well it's more of a journal really, I've done it for quite a few years, and every day I fill it in recording personal details of how I feel, uh, personal details of physical, spiritual, and mental, what I've done, where I've been, and I include issues that affect us nationally, events that dominated the news, etc. And occasionally we look back, I said to her, I wonder what we did 12 months ago, and out comes the journal. And uh, in the middle of June, when we're going through the pandemic, last year, at that time, we were in Landudno, strolling along the seafront without a care in the world. And I said to Elsie, if we'd have known then, walking along that seafront, almost mentally making plans for next year as we walked along, how could we have known? What 12 months would bring? How could we have possibly known what was going to happen? But we didn't. It, it was hidden from us. 
Some would say if we did know in advance, we could have done something to prevent it. Others maybe would have worried themselves sick for 12 months waiting for the inevitable. So what's the Christian stance on this? What does the Christian say about the future? About not only tomorrow, but the long-term future. And the Apostle Paul in his second letter to Corinth Church says, We live by faith, not by sight. And this statement lies at the very heart of the Christian way of life. Between Paul's first letter and this second one to Corinth, he paid them a visit. There were murmurings regarding his fitness to lead. There was some opposition to him, so he came to see them. And then in the second letter, he outlines what his mission was. That it's not about him, it's about his work for the Lord. He says, in effect, we don't compromise our faith or trust God's word to, to, or, or twist God's word to suit ourselves. This life is what it is, whatever befalls. Uh, the message version in chapter 4 says we've been spiritually terrorised. Think of that, being spiritually terrorised. That opposition, that constant abuse that they, uh, Paul and his companions, uh, uh, companions uh, experienced. But it didn't define them. That didn't define them. It wasn't about what they could see or experience in human terms. I'm sure on occasion, humanly speaking, they could have thrown the towel in. But what defined them wasn't their circumstances, but their faith in God through Jesus Christ. You see, they couldn't see around corners, but God could. They couldn't see a way out, but God could. And that's why they continued by faith, because they were convinced of God's presence, his leading, his influence. And that's why he says, we live by faith, not by sight. The things they saw and experienced sometimes would have the potential to overwhelm them without this faith in God. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Paul and his companions were acutely aware of not just this world, but the world to come. Faith was for this world, sight was for the next when in the presence of God they would see what through faith they had hoped for. They would no longer need to live by faith, but for the moment they would live by faith, not sight. But in heaven with Christ Jesus, they would live by sight. We don't need to see what lies ahead of us as much as we'd like to on occasions. It's hid from us. I saw a cartoon once and it's got a big shop front and it said, Madam Zara, fortunes told. And on the door was a notice said, due to unforeseen circumstances, we've moved to number seven. <laughs> As Christians, we're called to live by faith. Faith in God through our living Lord Jesus Christ, not by what we see or by what we experience. The problem is that if we're not careful, our circumstances can dominate us to such an extent that in the end, it's that which defines us. Paul could so easily have been defined by what he experienced in his ministry. Later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he describes the things he experienced. Prison, floggings, near-to-death experiences, beatings, stones, shipwrecked, opposition from Jew and Gentile alike. And so it goes on. But that didn't define him. If it had, he would, I'm sure, have packed it all in. John Wesley in his journal says that he didn't like field preaching. He much preferred a commodious room with a soft cushion and a handsome pulpit. But he said, the devil doesn't like field preaching either. So for that reason, I put it all to one side and I do it for the gospel's sake. On another occasion, when someone asked why he put himself through so much opposition and hardship, you see, we preachers have it easy these days. We think there's opposition. Wesley used to get chucked in the brook. He used to have stones slung at him. He had his clothes ripped off his back. He had animals set on him. I don't know what happened the next day, but, <laughs> you know, and so he, he had all this to, 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 to contend with. But he said, um, I put myself through it because if I wasn't convinced of another world beyond this one, I really wouldn't do it. But he was convinced of the world to come. Of course, some of the things that we face are awful. I know I've been there. And if I'm honest, there have been times when I couldn't get past the circumstance. I was defined by that circumstance. Illness, family tragedy, redundancy, you've been there. 
But over the years, I've known God's presence. And when we become, of, become aware of his presence with us, it brings encouragement to the body and to the soul. We need to get to the point where faith in God is as natural as breathing. When we first went out with the masks on, I was nervous the very first time. I said to myself, what if we're the only ones down the street with the masks on? I said, we're going to look like idiots, aren't we walking up the street with masks? What if nobody else has got them on? But uh, we put the mask on and, and off we went into the shop and everybody got masks on and we didn't feel too bad after that. And now we just, we just do it, like you've done it this morning, we just do it. We need to exercise faith, just do it. Just do it. What motivated those early Christians? What motivated the Apostle Paul? Verse 14, he says this, For Christ's love compels us. That was their motivation. That was his motivation. It was very specific. Not some wishy-washy idea of God who may or may not be there, but the sure and certain knowledge of Christ's presence with them by his Holy Spirit who led them, guided them, and helped them through any situations they were like to face. They were absolutely convinced that when Christ died on the cross, he died for everyone, and they were equally convinced that when he rose from the dead and gloriously seated himself next to God in the highest heavens, he did it for everyone. So he said, we live by faith, not by sight. Whatever the circumstance, it was always to give God the glory. I heard a little story of a church that was based in the main street, very similar to our high street, based in the main street. And in big letters over the front of the church, it said, glory to God in the highest. Uh, and they turned up for church one day and the letter E had fallen off and smashed on the floor. And the first thought was, oh no, more expense, how are we going to get up there? And then somebody says, no, leave it. And they said, well, we can't leave it. They said, yes, we can. Look what it says. Glory to God in the high street. You see, take advantage of the situation for his glory. In the opening verses of chapter 5, Paul talks about our earthly bodies as tents. A typical analogy from Paul because we read in Acts chapter 18 verses 1 to 3 that Paul met one Aquila, a Jew who was from, exiled from Rome, and then he visited Aquila and Priscilla, his wife, and it says, because he was a tent maker, as they were, he worked with them. So we know he was a tent maker. And so this analogy of tents was quite natural for him to talk about. And he talks about our spiritual beings, our earthly beings, being in a tent. I don't know whether you've had experience at tents. I have. Not good. Not good. When I was 23, yeah, we're going back a bit. When I was 23 and a long distance coach driver, we used to go all over the place during the summer months for weeks, weeks away. We used to go Scotland, Cornwall, Devon, all over the place. And one day they said to me, we've got a job for you next week. A load of Boy Scouts, a troop of Boy Scouts from Kettering, along with all their equipment, the tents and everything, and they're going camping for a week to the Rhine Valley in Germany. So I said, right, okay, so I said, so, where am I staying then? And he didn't answer me. Because <laughs> we usually have hotels when we went away for a week. <laughs> so I said, I suppose I'll be in the tent, shall I? And he never answered me. <laughs> well, we got to the Rhine Valley and it was a beautiful setting. Absolutely wonderful. Right along the sea, the, the, the Rhine was there and plenty of room to park the coach and all the rest of it. And we went out for day trips here and there. They set the camp up and I'm looking around, I can't see any hotels. Can't see any hostelries. And I'm looking around, and then the, the, the troop leader came over and said, well, we've set your tent up for you, Dick. <laughs> Look, there it is over there. And it was a nice tent, nothing wrong with it. He said, everything is there for you, everything you want, it's all in that tent. He says, you'll be self-contained. He says, you, you know, nobody will disturb you, you'll be fine. I said, well, thank you very much. Well, that first night, that first night, I, I, I know the Apostle Paul was talking about our earthly bodies when he said, we groan and are burdened. But I groaned and I was burdened. <laughs> I didn't like it in the tent. I wasn't comfortable. There were gnats. There were German gnats. <laughs> with little helmets on with spikes on them. <laughs> and 
you know, and so the next day he said, how'd you get on? I said, well, I said, it's very kind of you and everything. I said, but would you mind very much if I slept in the coach for the rest of the week? And he said, no, whatever's best for you. So the rest of the week I took all my goods and chattels and I slept on the back seat of the coach, which was a lot more comfortable. <laughs> and then we got back and to UK after the week and took them up to catch and dropped all the equipment off. Uh, and that was that. The Apostle Paul says, one day we shall pack our tent away. And when we pack that tent away, we should be given a new one. We should be having a glorious tent to live in. It won't be a tent with all its aches and pains. It won't be a tent with all its discomfort. It will be a tent which will be a glorious tent in the presence of God. And he said, I can't wait to get my new tent, as it were. So yes, in this life we do groan, we do creak, and we do have all the things that cause us problems, but the Lord Jesus Christ made it possible for us to live in that new situation with a new and glorious body where Revelation says there'll be no more tears, there'll be no more crying, there'll be no more death, there'll be no more pain, no more suffering. That's the promise for you and for me. The impact Christ had made on Paul's life was remarkable. Let's not forget that before that encounter on the road to Damascus, he was a persecutor of Christians. If we look into the book of Acts, we read this, chapter 8. On that great day, per, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul, Paul, began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. And then in chapter 9, verse 1, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way where the men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. That was Paul before the Lord Jesus spoke to him on the Damascus Road. That was Paul before he was changed miraculously into this man who was now living by faith for the gospel. Because of Christ's intervention, the reality of it came uh, and, and proved itself. And this is why he said to the people, I'm not talking about myself here, I'm talking about what God has done. He was always pointing towards God. So Paul says, we live by faith. Faith in our Lord Jesus. Some will say, yes, okay. But that was then. Is it really relevant to today? Life has changed so much. Technology is key, they say. Technology is king. They say, I can Google anything and everything. I'm never off my phone or iPad. They say if I couldn't access my phone or laptop or iPhone, I, I don't know what I'd do. I'd be lost. Well, let me tell you, if mankind wasn't able to access God through prayer, through the Lord Jesus Christ, mankind would be lost. Technology has its place, although sometimes I wonder if it actually does. But when the soul longs for peace... When life seems to have very little meaning, when you're racked with guilt, when your heart is breaking, no computer or compulsive technology is going to help you. Faith in Christ Jesus will. When Jesus started his ministry in Luke 4, he went to his local synagogue in Nazareth and a scroll was handed to him. It was Isaiah and he read these words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recover sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the year of God's favour. And when he sat down, he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your presence. He was saying, God wants to free mankind from the bondage of sin. He wants you to lay your sins before him for uh, the, the, the forgiveness that he gives. He was saying God wants to open spiritual eyes to the things beyond this world. He was saying God wants to heal those whose hearts are breaking because of their circumstance. He was saying God's time is now and he said it all comes through me, the Lord Jesus Christ said. Faith in Christ Jesus is just as relevant today, if not more so, as the world with all its riches fails to satisfy again and again. One of the wealthiest men in modern times once declared to a friend, I am not to be envied. 
How can my wealth help me? I would give you my millions if you could give me your youth and health. And the book of Ecclesiastes, you, you all know about the book of Ecclesiastes, there it talks of everything being just blown about by the wind and, and pointless and useless. The Apostle Paul writes in his first letter to Timothy, he says, Tell those who are rich in the pre present world not to be arrogant, nor put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. The world may have changed. We're experiencing some of that this morning. But the gospel message is as fresh and relevant today as it's always been. To experience this life of faith, we have to steep ourselves daily in God's word. We have to steep ourselves daily in God's uh, connection through prayer. In other words, we've got to want it. It's so easy to put God on an emergency footing till we need him. The early church spent time in prayer daily. It was their lifeline. It's ours. The life of faith that Paul talks of was a life to, devoted to the cause 24-7 not just for emergencies. It's easy when everything is going well to just ride along on the feel-good factor. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, in his sermon to the Israelites before they entered the Promised Land, Moses said to the people, you've had it pretty bad in the wilderness, but now you're going over into this land. You'll, there'll be houses that you didn't build, there'll be cities that you didn't build, there'll be vineyards that you didn't plant. Now, when you get there, don't forget God who brought you out. They could have been like children let loose in a sweet factory and forgot all about God. This life of faith that Paul talks about doesn't forget about God when all's well, but it thanks God and rejoices in his name that all is going well. There may be times when God makes us wait for a particular answer to prayer. The very first line in the opening chapter of Habakkuk, the prophet wows in, desire, in despair. He says this, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? He, he was watching his nation deteriorate. It seemed that evil was overcoming good, and it was getting worse. And it got worse eventually. The Babylonians overthrew them and took captives. And the whole book is really a conversation between Habakkuk and God about how it's all going to work out. But the very last verse of the book, with a shout of confidence, a complete opposite to that opening verse where he says, How long? He says this, The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. Through everything he sees around him, he still acknowledges God and his greatness. You see, the life of faith converses with God. The life of faith puts its questions to God. It questions God. It concerns all the things to do with God. It puts the concerns before God. Even if it takes a long time, we allow God to answer. We acknowledge that God is supreme. His word is sure and his ways are the best ways. I'm sure all of us at times have questioned God's wisdom. Maybe we've wondered why he hasn't moved quicker. Maybe we've wondered why he hasn't moved at all. Maybe we've allowed our prayer time and study to become sparse, which then impacts on our faith. Maybe there's unforgiven sin in our lives, which keeps coming back and coming back and coming back. Maybe our circumstances have overwhelmed us to the extent that we're not able to pray. I understand all that. But I've said this before, when you don't feel like praying, pray anyway. Pray anyway. You see, the Christian faith is not about how we feel. It's not our feelings. It's about the fact of the Lord Jesus Christ who died for sinners on the cross, such as me. It's not about how we feel. How are you this morning? How's lockdown affected you this morning? It may have taken its toll on you, not just physically, mentally, but spiritually. Have you drifted from where you once were because of the world that we see around us and the concerns we have for that world? Have the circumstances overwhelmed you? Are you still being challenged and overwhelmed by what you see around you? Uh, there isn't a Christian alive who at some point didn't in their life uh, feel that way. The Lord knows and wants to minister as only he can. 
Maybe you're hearing this for the first time. This life of faith in Christ Jesus, and you're wondering if it's possible for you. Well, it is with the Lord's help. Take your concerns to him. Acknowledge that you're not all that God wants you to be. Lay your wrong actions, your attitudes, and yes, even your thoughts before him for his cleansing. I'm sure we all of us have regrets, but your past will only hold you back if you hold on to it. Christ Jesus died on the cross to take your past, to take your regrets, your sins upon himself, so that by faith you may be free to live how he wants you to do, ready to move forward in faith wherever he wants you to lead you. What defines you this morning? What defines you this morning? What do people see? Is it someone who's no different to anyone else, battling along from day to day, being jostled uncontrollably from one crisis to the next? Or someone who trusts in God and by faith holds fast to the one who holds those circumstances, who sees round the corners, who sees the end of what you're going through? How many times have you heard people say, it's only my faith that's kept me going? Maybe you've said it yourself. That's how God intended, did you know that? That's how God intended, that it is only your faith that should keep you going. Faith in God who created you. Faith in him who knows all about you. Faith in him who loves you like you wouldn't believe. And that's why Paul says, we live by faith, not by sight. Is that you today? Is that you? Are you living by faith? Or by what you see? Let's pray. Lord God, our heavenly, eternal Father, you know how we struggle. You know, Lord, the times when our faith ebbs low because of our circumstances. You know, Lord, the times when we really struggle as Christians and we ask why and we ask when and sometimes we take our eyes off you because our circumstances are so overwhelming. Yet, Lord, you are there, you're waiting, you're longing to minister to us. Help us, Lord, each one in our weakness that we might come before you boldly acknowledging that you died on the cross for us and, and that you wouldn't have done that unless you really cared. And we pray, Lord, that you will give us confidence in our walk with you, that whatever comes along, whatever is troubling us, whatever is paramount in our lives minute by minute of every day, we pray, Lord, that in the light of your presence within us, we might know and feel a positive through all that negative, that we might know and feel your presence. Bless us, Lord, out of your great love for us. Have mercy, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.